This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, we're back. We're live. It's our last show of the week. It's the 4 o'clock block on a Friday. Wow, exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Marcia Joyner is here to act as my co-host, and I'm acting as her co-host, okay? Well, we, uh, we are honored today uh, to have Connie Alla Ng, and he is representative, state, state representative from Maui. Welcome to the show, Connie Alla. No, thanks. Thanks for having me. Glad yeah, to be great here. to have you here. We have important things to discuss. We, we do, but I just want to make one caveat for people that usually watch the 4 o'clock show on Friday. Beatrice is um, in California to have treatments, and she will be back this week. The plane arrives late today, so we said, yes, we would absolutely be here in her stead. So here we are. Okay. So for all of her viewers, give her your prayers, and she will be back. We're sitting in for her today. Yes. And I hope her plane does not get jammed up at the airport because uh, of your president, Donald Trump, uh, who was here let's today. Let's don't. And let's don't tomorrow. even leave him home. Yeah, yeah. Okay, don't even talk about it. Okay. Forget him. <laughs> it is, we've got a nice, young, beautiful man who is starting out in politics who has Honey, a I great... called you beautiful. Yeah. Well, okay. <laughs> so, listen, uh, at my age, young. I can do that. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> but he's starting out this whole new... It, it, it's hopeful for me to see young people like this to take a step forward it's very in politics. Important. We it need is, this it is really next generation important. kind of thing. We need the vitality. See this. Yes, we need to see this. Yeah, yeah. We don't need any more warmed over yeah. politics. We don't need glass ceilings. Yeah, we don't need it. So you might run for office. Can you talk about it just a little? Well I'm in office. I've um, no, I mean first, another actually, office aside. Well I mean I'm I'm sort of an unlikely politician. I don't come from money or power. Uh, my mom worked at Liberty House. My dad waited right. tables <laughs> out of a U member um, at a hotel. So, uh, you know, it, it, when I first ran for office at 22, people, I could count the amount of folks who thought I had a chance with <laughs> one hand, and half of them lived at my mom's house, actually. Uh, but, you know, we had this idea that if you actually listen to people, um, that it doesn't matter who's on the other side. So we, I knocked on 15,000 doors. Personally, wow, that's so um, in a Republican district against a uh, Tea Party incumbent, oh, wow. and we won by 26 percent. And so right. since then, I've just been trying to, um, you know, not let the influx of money in politics affect my decisions. Uh, kind of keep that grassroots feel. Yeah. Uh, we do engage a lot on social media and and stuff, which you know, sort of, uh, a lot of folks my age do. But it is really old school in the fact that we're actually going door to door and making that personal connection. So I think that's. Um, how it's been. It's been six years, though, in the State House, and the things I want to do for my district um, I have accomplished. And now uh, I serve as majority policy leader, uh, issues of statewide importance, like well, the what, issue what that we're is, going to talk about what, today. What is majority policy? What, what does that mean? So in the House, thanks, thanks for asking. So in the House and the Senate, we both have our priorities, and so it's not just like a bunch of ideas thrown against the wall and see what sticks at the beginning of session. Um, we have majority policy leader that brings the different chairs together and tries to figure out where we have common ground and where we can push forward a package together. Um, and it has to be issues of statewide importance. So climate change, global warming, um, sea level rise. You know, if, if Waikiki goes underwater, the whole state's economy is pretty much wiped I'm out. I'm glad you're thinking about that. Yeah, so it's, it's how the, it's, we really don't have time on our side. And that's what the scientists yesterday really revealed, yeah. that we need to act uh, now. Yeah. Um, and you know, for folks like me, the future is not an abstraction. Like this is our survival on the line. Yeah. 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 So you might consider another office. Yeah. So with the with the vacating of um, Colleen Hanabusa, who's uh, looking to run for governor, it, it leaves a sort of vacuum in Hawaii politics. Yes, and I know, um, you know, Mark Takai, who held a seat before her. He was actually the first legislator I met. I was ASUH president at the time, UH student body president. <laughs> Linda Lingo cut our university about $130 million. So I sent this email to, um, to the legislator saying, hey, you know, can you meet with students? Can we discuss this? He was the only one who met with me. <laughs> uh, and he told me, because he was He's ASUH a, he, president no, He was too. a great guy. Yeah, and yeah. he was ASUH president as well. So he showed me what he did as president and through his time in the legislature. And I really got the bug. I'm like, wow, you can really accomplish a lot through public service. Um, unfortunately, um, Mark wasn't able to um, serve out the, thir the 20 years yeah, that he committed to tragic, that job. Yeah. So, um, you know, as a, he was a mentor to me, and 
uh, the shoes that really can't be filled. But uh, I really like to um, you know continue on that legacy and get in there, uh, commit decades, and really gain the seniority we need because um, this Trump thing will come and go. But what's going to change is the you know the makeup of the house. There's yeah. going to there's going to be a democratic democratic majority eventually, yeah. and what we need is seniority in order for our small yeah. state to really long make an term. impact. Oh. Yeah. And yeah. So that's so, why I'm considering the yeah. run taking a yeah, shot. That's great. Seat. Now you were you, on that. <laughs> you graduated commandment school, did you? Or, I, I did. Yeah. You did. And then yeah. uh, UH. My dad went to Kaimuki High School. My mom went to HCC. Uh, didn't finish. They fell in love and. You know, started a family really early, so uh, you know we're first first generation college graduate. Uh, my dad passed away when I was around 12, so uh, we relied on government programs and our community and teachers and coaches and our church. And you know, I picked pineapples. That was my first paycheck. Uh, so I kind of so I understand that like the when you look at like the when I talk to my grandmother, if she didn't stand up against the corporate establishment of her time, or at least the political establishment at the time. I might still be on the plantation, right? So it's how do we honor those roots that really created the middle class here yes. in Hawaii to yes. rebuild our middle class, yes. which is sort of getting pushed out by, yes. um, you know, the international investors coming in. And, um, you know, if, I mean, you just look at, at, at uh, Kaka'ako, you see, like, these luxury high-rises, um, that these condos going for $20 million a piece now. Or more. Or more, <laughs> literally adjacent to veterans and Native Hawaiians living on the streets yeah. Yeah. and it's just we're asking like you just gotta ask like who are we building for yeah. you know and what can we do about it yeah. um th th i think that's what's frustrating a lot of everyday folks when i talk to them is yeah. um you know can we build our way out of this probably not with an insatiable demand coming from the mainland uh, we're gonna have to do some controls for probably tax luxury homes um, empty units and actually subsidize workforce and affordable housing so that's the so there's sort of things we're focusing on now through the house. And federally, uh, we definitely could use more infrastructure funds. I think we need to spearhead really bold infrastructure spending to the tune of trillions, actually, instead of just throwing that to the military and elsewhere. Um, and then in turn, that would create thousands of jobs, move us to a renewable energy future. And um, you know, if, if another rail situation happens, uh, it won't fall on the backs of white residents if we have that massive amount of federal funding. Yeah. So, wow. So that's well, yeah, great points coming out. Yeah, this so resonates with, with my whole world view. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and, I, I don't know if it's appropriate for like, big tech. <laughs> let's go back to the priorities then, based on what you just said. Now, you say the name of the committee again? Uh, so the committee I chair is Ocean Marine Resources no, no, and Water No, I meant the priority committee. Oh, uh, I, so I serve as majority policy leader. Majority policy leader. And, okay. And the chair of this ocean so, committee. So what are those projects, the ones that have, have priority? Can you tell us, or have you decided yet? We're working on it now. So we had a yeah. retreat for the, it was the first time this happened in about at least 20 years under the leadership of um, Scott Psyche. Mm -hmm. uh, he just came in. He decided that rather than just having everyone sub submit their priorities and then having the majority leaders trying to sift through them. That we actually bring all the subject matter chairs into the room and we discuss our priorities, our red flags um, for our communities that they don't like, and um, our committee goals. And then, so we all went around and did that, and then that way we could work out the kinks. That's and, a very good idea. That is, and that and it was it was probably the most like substantive policy discussion I've seen in my six years yeah. in the legislature. And some of the more veteran folks, 12, 20 years, said yeah. um, said similar things. So it was actually. I know folks get like disheartened. They think that we just act politically and expediently, but everyone that gets involved in public service, um, even the ones that can seem jaded at times, they're they're really ma. Like they really understand the policy behind the things they're doing, and their hearts are coming from the right place. So it was yeah. it was sort of a, this was just last week. It was a real um, encouraging. Uh, meeting, so you know, I'm looking forward to following through, and hopefully we can come yeah. up. So with it's all about I, I policy, yes. you know. It's all about. It and, is. And, and, and a lot of a lot of legislators say, you know, bring me your issues, bring me your suggestions, and I will sign bills or whatever it is. But really, it should be. We think about this all day. Yeah. We have policy priorities. We will deliver ideas to you, and then you can react to us. Yeah. 
and then we will adopt legislation based on our perception of those policy points. This is a better way to do it, government. It is wonderful. <laughs> I've never heard, in all the years I've been a handmaiden to power, I have never heard this happening. Never. And it's a wonderful idea. Uh, the Democratic Party, in its platform, said these are our priorities. They sent all these priorities to the legislature. Eighty were not even acted upon. Eighty of those priorities weren't even acted upon. Mm -hmm. So this is a great time, a way to look at, okay, the party sent this. Yeah. Let's look at this. What out of this can we yeah. really did, have? Did, did, you, did you say that you, you're a handmaiden to government? I no, a handmaiden to power. A oh, handmaiden to power? Yeah. Oh, okay. You heard it here on Think Tech. <laughs> 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 handmaiden to power. Okay. Yeah, handmaiden. Let's let's go on. Let's move right along. Yeah. Now, let's go on to this, this the, the conference on on yesterday yes. at the, at the Capitol on our reefs. Yes. Let's talk about that big environmental question. It yes. was what is it? Ma reef madness. Reef, reef madness. Reef madness. Yeah. Great title. Yeah, not to be confused with the uh, 1970s propaganda piece. <laughs> no, 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 no. We're not, we're not going there. This was about the ocean. So, uh, what what happened? Oh, so the idea was, uh, I don't know, a lot of people, a lot of people watch that Netflix documentary, Chasing Coral, so it's been on the fore of folks' consciousness over the last few months. So we thought this was a good opportunity. Star Advertiser did a great article about the state of our reefs and overfishing. So we started contacting researchers, community groups, and the department. Me meaning your committee, uh, your, your, well, your group, me, your policy group. Me and just my office staff. And okay, out of session, I only have one now, office staff. His name is Alan Alcohol, and he's the you, great You're job. chair of, this com of which committee? The Ocean Marine Resources and Hawaiian Affairs. Oh, so that's a perfect place for this yeah, to yeah. be. Yes. Okay. So then I, we worked with um, Chris, Chris Lee from Kailua sure. through his committee, in Energy and Environmental Protection, sure. and we did a joint um, hearing. And the idea was often when you go through the session, um, the department is saying we don't have enough data, um, and the scientists are saying we need to take action here, but they're taking um, like the politics for granted, the politicians are taking the science for granted, and there's like this disconnect between the three parties. Yeah. So we figure if we bring the researchers um, from NOAA and UH and the DLNR and DAR yeah. um, and policymakers into the same room, then we can sort of hold each other accountable and create that. Um, synergy or stop any chasms that might come up and that's actually what happened so we broke it up to three three sessions the first on coral bleaching uh, which has kind of been on the really a big issue in the last few years the Great Barrier Reef um, the biggest reef in the world outside Australia is effectively dead um, oh. due to a catastrophic uh, coral bleaching event just, what was, there, what, what was the event ago. was it they call it bleaching events. Um, it just it just happens. It's almost spontaneously. Uh, the sea level temperature goes up a couple oh, of degrees, sure. Yeah. Sure. and all of a sudden environmental this, changes. Yeah, yeah. This yeah. happens. And uh, so that's the dead reef. That's the dead reef. Yeah. Well, that one might not. Yeah, that yeah. one's actually dead. So at first it turns white, and then can it, we go back? It, even one? though it's bleached, it can still recover. But after a certain point, it's like that. Yeah, right there. That's dead. That might still have a chance. So they bleach and then they can come back because like reefs are made up of, of a whole bunch of yeah. living different living creatures and polyps. So it's like a, it's not necessarily like one creature. So it's like an ecosystem in itself. So it, it's we don't have exact science of um, you know how, how quickly or uh, resilient they can recover. Um, so what happened in Australia could happen here. Yeah. Could happen here. And actually, there's been a couple really bad. Um, bleaching events in the last few years and the scientists are saying that if we don't act now um, then it's likely that our reefs will actually be devastated. Big, big question though, Connie Ellis. So why do we care? Why do we care if the reef dies? How does it affect you and me and even Marsha? <laughs> Well, well, first is, is recreation, so I don't know. I haven't been snorkeling much, I don't know about y'all. So th that's the first thing. But that affects the tourism market because they rely on, you know, selling snorkels and their tours. Um, but And secondly, probably much more importantly, is our local food supply and, like, the longline fishing industry and nearshore fishing industries. Uh, and lastly, just generally, if uh, an economist did a study on Hawaii's reefs, and I think the estimate was around... Um, uh, seven billion dollar value to our economy and that's very conservative so if our reefs were to be devastated uh, our entire economy would 
would take a would probably fall into a, a statewide recession. Yeah, yeah. Well, let me let me add a thought though, uh, and I'm sure this came up in your discussion is that is that the reefs are um, we don't know the full extent of the effect of the decline of the reefs on our environment, our greater environment. Um, so uh, changes in in in, in seawater temperature. That affects the reef, but then if the reef dies, part of the ecology is gone. It's out of the picture, and you don't know what happens after that. What other forms of life are affected? What other effects there are in the in the ocean in general, uh, and on the land for that matter? So, I mean, we don't know the whole story yet. We only know it's a bad story if we lose the reefs. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me about this this suntan lotion. The bill was before the legislature last year and didn't pass. But that has an effect on the reef, the suntown, whatever that chemical is in the suntown lotion. So what happens now with that? Okay, well we, so the hearing is broken up to three parts. The first was coral bleaching, the second was overfishing, and the third was um, water quality and toxins and pollution. Um, and then we had, you know, community groups, researchers, and the department weigh in for all three. Now, um, in regards to coral bleaching, the, the number one effect, or the number one cause is actually carbon emissions. So anything we can do to move towards our 100% renewable energy goal is welcome, but we can't do that alone. It needs to be global action. And uh, President Trump's decision to pull out of the Paris Agreement um, is a horrible set backwards for um, our new renewable energy goals and reducing emissions, but particularly in the way it affects our reefs. So that was the most I mean, if, if we had a scientist on the show, they'd probably do a much better job explaining this, but that was the, their main takeaway point, was that uh, carbon emissions is the number one thing for coral bleaching. For the reef pop, the fish populations, we need more marine protected areas. So Governor Ige came out with this initiative, protecting 30% of nearshore fisheries by, 20, by 30, 2030. I think it's a great initiative. There's no teeth to it. So what does that mean? What is those Yeah, what is it? Like? How do you protect it? Yes. It's aspirational. So if you look at West Hawaii, um, there's, but, but to their credit, the department seems to be a lot more open to it. And in yesterday, yesterday's hearing, we got them to um, agree to support a, a mandate uh, for 2030. So it's not just an aspirational goal, it's yeah. a mandate. And then they can actually make a case for funding because it's a legislative mandate. So how do you, so. How do you accomplish this? How do you implement the, the, the goal, the aspirational goal? Yeah, so, so we need to map out. Uh, for me, it'd be a, my ideal uh, reef management or fishery management system would encompass um, fully protected, marine protected areas with no take, but just in small areas because even if you have like a small bay that's protected, uh, it kind of trickles out, it's like a nucleus sure. for fish populations, and then you expect fishermen to fit fish right outside of it, and that's not a bad thing, like that's the point, right? So there's more fish, uh, so it actually encourages fishing. Uh, and then um, more like herbivore re replenishment areas for like aquarium populations at Uhu, which is really under threat, the parrot fish that make our sand. Yeah. And then um, community-based fisheries, like we've seen in Mo'omomi and Haena, where you actually go to the community and you, the people that use that area as their icebox, the kupuna and the subsistence fishers who know the tides and um, breeding patterns better than any like bureaucrat or politician, um, they make the rules themselves and they, they do it through DONR. And that's a model that's been really successful across the world, mm -hmm. and we're finally catching on here. So mm -hmm. that's a, and they'll map it out and then work with the department, and um, it's just a matter of how quickly they can do it and whether or not they have enough resources. And then, of course, enforcement and funding don't care. This is a big subject. It uh, is. So and it, uh, actually, we're going to take a short break. Okay. We're going to regroup, and when we come back, we're going to let Marsha ask her question, which is driving her. It is. She's the handmaiden yeah. of power. <laughs> and uh, and I, I, I hear you. I just, the, the Oxyben zone, we'll get to it. Yeah, that, okay, that we'll one. be right back after a short <laughs> break. You too, Marsha. <laughs> Planning all week for the day of the big game. Watching at home just doesn't feel the same. What on the list is who's gonna drive? It's nice to know you're gonna get home alive. Plan for fun and responsibility. Choose the DD. Captain of our team. It's the DD. For every game day, assign a designated driver. Guys, don't forget to check me out right here at the Prince of Investing. I'm your host, Prince Dykes, 
each and every Tuesdays at 11 a.m. Hawaii time. I'm going to be right here. Stop by here from some of the best investment minds across the globe in real estate, finances, stocks, hedge funds, managers, all of that great stuff. Thank you. Guess what? This is Think Tech. And we're here late on Friday afternoon. And we're, gee, it's our 4 o'clock show with Kaniela Ng, state representative. And uh, he is the um, majority policy leader of the state legislature. Did I get that right? State House. Of the state house yeah. in majority policy leader of the state house, which I is very that's, important because important. they wonderful. identify issues and determine priorities. Very important for coordinating all the committees, especially in environment. Okay, and you had a, a conference just yesterday at the state capitol involving the what is it, the reefs, uh, the reef madness, as you will, um, to examine with uh, appropriate experts from UH and otherwise and legislators and anyone interested, I suppose, came down to participate in discussion about what we, what the problem is with the reefs, what the direction of that problem is, and how we fix it, and this is the program is called Solutions to Overfishing, but it's not only overfishing, mm -hmm. it's, right. it's, uh, it's suntan lotion either. Suntan lotion. And, and uh, also, and we were talking about that during the break. Can, can you, you had a question, Marsha. I know you had a question, and I want to offer you the opportunity to finally, after all this time, express yourself. Okay. Uh, this last year, uh, last two sessions, in fact, this issue came up about the suntan lotion and that chemical that's in the suntan lotion, and that is... Oxybenzone. Oxybenzone, okay. And it comes up all the time, and if you've been to Waikiki and you walk down the beach, you can actually smell copper tone. You smell it. It's there. And they say that one chemical is part of the reason the, chem the reefs are dying. I want to know if that's part of the priority, if we can get it past the lobbyist this year, which we haven't been able to do the last two years. So no, copper tone is owned by Bayer. Bayer just bought Monsanto, and you know, among environments, Monsanto is a dirty word. Can we get it done this year? Personally, I hope so. I, I hope so. I'm not speaking on um, behalf of the entire house right now because that's something it, the majority policy um, that things that we push as a body tend to be. Um, things that have been worked through, uh, so there's a little bit less kinks. So um, this year, hopefully, like vote by mail, um, you know, paid family and sick leave, those sorts of things have a really good shot. Um, these more particular issues, I'll definitely be spearheading it through my committee. I know um, uh, the chair of Energy and Environmental Protection will also be seeing this bill. Uh, Representative Chris Lee has been supportive in the past of finding a way forward. Um, the question is, is it going to be a ban on usage, a ban on sale? Is there some kind of compromise that can be reached? Um, for me, I, I tend to be more precautionary. If, we, if there's data that says that it may be dangerous and there's not enough data and there's no anal meta-analysis, then it's better to be safe than sorry. Like, if there's no data to say that it's really harmful, um, from, in my mind, we need to prove that it's not harmful. And that's actually how most um, industrialized, especially European mm -hmm. nations, handle these sorts of environmental policies. But what's the damage about it? There's no damage in passing such a, such a, a measure, right? Well, so mm -hmm. some guys can't sell some kind of suntan lotion. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, so I think last year we had uh, like ABC store mm -hmm. against it. Um, copper tone lobby. Of course. Uh, but there are suntan the lotions that are not as destructive, right? Yes. Yeah, so as long as there are, there's an alternative, then um, there's not much damage for the public. Uh, it is, uh, if you use, there are some that rub really well. They're a little bit more expensive, but not drastically. And, you know, once the, um, you know, once they're, they're able to produce them in more bulk, you know, the price might go down. But uh, uh, I think the, the issue with oxybenzone is not just when it rubs off into the water, but actually it absorbs into your skin. Uh, this is what came out of the hearing yesterday. Yes. It absorbs into your skin, and then after you, like it can enter our sores and our injection wells through urine, and then really pollute uh, the water quality that way as well. How about your body? To say nothing of your body. To say yeah. nothing <laughs> of your body. body. Yeah. You know, oh, who yeah. knows what the effect and, is and there? Can you imagine yeah. what this does to little kids on the beach? Right, being yeah. exposed to it. Being, no, I meant rubbing it into their skin. Mm. 
yeah. as they're growing and their immune system and all of those kind of things. And again, if there's unknowns, like it's, I don't think it's, it's not necessarily responsible for me to be like, you know, danger, danger. But I, I, again, there's the precautionary principle is like we shouldn't wait until there's a sacrificial lamb to yeah, take action yeah. or, or millions like we did with Big Tobacco. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, okay, if I'm a parent and I do this and I know that you knew and didn't tell us, then I can sue you. <laughs> you, mean, you mean the, the, the producer of the, yeah. of the yeah. suntan lotion? Mm -hmm. Well, who knows what the story is there. Oh, can, I, can I shift gears for a minute? Yes, can we please. talk about fishing for a minute? Okay, what, what was the discussion on fishing, and did it include aquaculture? I think the biggest takeaway from the scientists, as, as, or in as much as there was a consensus, um, was that uh, people are the problem. And you can control for water quality and whatever else, but the areas that are the most depleted, the fisheries that are most depleted, are the areas with the big, highest populations and the most density. So Oahu is south side, um, sure. Actually, the entire island of Oahu, sure. um, west and south Maui uh, are just like completely, like the fisheries are almost wiped out. Yeah. And uh, Molokai is. Is that within uh, territorial right. waters or, or does, does it extend outside beyond territorial waters? So, the focus with uh, Dr. Friedlander's research, he's the one that was, uh, that made that front page Star Advertiser article last week um, or two weeks ago. His research is mostly about um, nearshore fisheries, uh, but there, there is Noah actually came to, and they talked a little bit more about um, like the pelagic fisheries as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What, what are the boundaries? The state, how far out of the water? Oh, I forget this. Uh, well, miles. the traditional state boundary is three miles. Yeah. Three miles. The contiguous zone is twelve miles. Mm -hmm. Are you, a, are you a fisher? Uh, no, I was in the Coast Guard once. Oh, oh okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so. So that's only 12 miles, and from Sandy Beach to Molokai is 39 miles. So, yeah, well, that, that's it's open water. That's open, open ocean water. between the islands. Yeah. Yeah. So, what about those waters? Who who determines fishing in those waters? Anybody? Uh, nobody. Nobody. Well, the federal government does. Uh huh. But that's not a state matter, I don't think. Sure, it yeah, is. Between I mean, the between the islands, maybe it could be a state it matter. Should be. But that would have to. I mean, the fish doesn't know, there's no sign underwater that tells yeah. the fish, you are now leaving <laughs> the state. Well, what about, I mean, what about that? I mean, it's been an industry in the state for many, many years. A lot of people live on fish that they catch yeah. in their small boats. Mm -hmm. um, they are fishing, overfishing. I mean, local people are overfishing, right? right. It's not only commercial, it's local people. Um, and exactly we, we right. have to do something to resurrect the fisheries, and this is... You know, remember the fight about the monument out there last couple of years with uh, uh, Obama? So, I mean, uh, to me, uh, this, is a, this is a critical problem. It's also, and I asked you also, it's, it's a critical problem about aquaculture, especially the big island uh, around Nella. Um, what are we, we going to do to allow aquaculture at the same time uh, resurrect the fisheries? This is not easy. Um, and I, I, I myself, I cannot think of measures that would actually accomplish this. Can you? No. Uh, I mean, look, when you're carrying a hammer, everything sort of looks like a nail. So we do try to look at things that um, we can affect through policy, but it's, it's sort of irresponsible and naive to think that, you know, being at the 20,000 foot level, we can just tinker with things and things will just fix. A lot of it will come from community action. What we can do is help facilitate education. Um, there, there was some funding a few years back. I don't even know if you remember that commercial on TV with the guy who's like, bragging up, he like pulls up with his truck and he's his friend, he's like, oh, bro, I caught all these fish. And the guy's like, what you gonna do with all that fish? You remember the commercial? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so the, that kind of thing to help people know, to, uh, get back to the indigenous roots of just take what you need um, and then leave the rest. And yeah. uh, But the issue is enforcement uh, for a lot of these. Yeah. Uh, because if you're doe care you, and there's like bag limits on certain fish, uh, and you're a DNR officer, you can't really inspect How would you the know? coolers. Yeah, yeah, how would without, you know? Especially without probable cause, you can't and really infringe on and are the there enough, human rights. And yeah. are there enough DLNR officers to look at the vast right. ma majority of fishing, all the fishing? The short answer is no. No, no yeah. yeah. All over the state. And they're overburdened. Yeah. Their scope of their duties are like, they have to enforce parking and everything. So we're trying to figure out a way to have just dedicated fishing enforcers um, fund more um, but the issue, like, like you alluded to, it's not necessarily just the commercial guys. 
uh, I think the biggest impact on nearshore fisheries is actually more recreational, everyday uh, fishers. One third of the population claims they fish today. Yeah, so yeah. Um, that's, we're the only st near sh um, shoreline state in the entire U.S. that doesn't have recreational fishing permits. Um, when you say that, some people are like, throw their hands in the air, like it's like a draconian thing. <laughs> but like th even a nominal fee, like $10 a year, can really make an impact when you're talking about thousands of um, fisher folk and going to, using that money for conservation. That's what I was going to ask. Would, that, way. And would that money hunting. be dedicated to a, all of these things, the, the environment, amount, if you got fishing permits, would that money be dedicated <laughs> to enforcement, to restocking to to whatever you had to do to make this a viable industry again yeah and the flip side of that remember i just came back from nelha uh is uh, aquaculture in cages that, that the law permits uh, right. and dlr dlnr manages uh off uh, off the big island but also in other possible yeah. areas um, where we can grow a lot of fish uh, for ourselves and even export without right. actually injuring um you know the uh, the fisheries right um, and we manage that, we regulate that pretty heavily, and I, I wonder if that's part of the discussion, because that be. kind of takes the pressure off if we can generate good fish populations and good fish production using those techniques. And yeah. if, if we do that, does that limit the mercury that people talk about in the fish? I, I don't know, because well, I'm not a fisher person. Does, if doing aquaculture, where you're growing fish in an environment, does that limit the mercury in the fish? Well, I don't think it makes a difference one way or the other. That's, that's an interesting question, though. I know mercury compounds over time, so if you're producing more fish as opposed to relying on larger fish, I suppose that's less mercury, because it's an like, like exponential increase, um, increase over years. Um, yeah, but it has to come from somewhere, though. Yeah. Anyway, we're about out of time. Uh, I wanted to ask you for final thoughts. Uh, there's camera one. Uh, they're all, all out there. Um, yeah. 1.3 million time. people watching you at least. <laughs> uh, so, Kaniella, what would you say to them? What would you leave with them as a, your message today? Oh, uh, yeah, so the coral, the coral, the state of our marine ecosystems in Hawaii is uh, dire, that we need to act now. But it's not without hope. I think if we uh, implement some marine protected areas, um, not, not shutting down fishing, but actually creating more fish in, in certain areas by uh, smart regulation, if we move to re recreational fishing permits, if we educate one another about not taking too much, not, you don't need 200 kole for every graduation party, uh, <laughs> Uh, and you know, taking care of uh, invasive species like roy, um, choosing the right types of sunscreen, and doing what we can to reduce carbon emissions. I think that's the number one. So that's what those are the actions we can take as individuals. If you see bills come up, um, lobby for them at the state capitol. And um, you know, when you're going to the ballot, think about th when you're going to elect someone. Don't on the federal level. Don't just think about like the style and whether or not you have that personal connection. I know it matters, but um, you know, is this person gonna be willing to fight for the environment and our marine ecosystems and our overall well-being um, despite what lobbyists and big money powers on the other side? So I think that's what we really need is, is people that are gonna um, not just bring back the Paris Agreement and uh, push for 100% renewable energy nationwide, um, but who's really gonna uh, St stick it to the people, really take on the, the forces on the other side, be it Bayer, Monsanto, or anyone else. Yeah, very thoughtful, actually. Yeah. Thank you, Kanye. All right. Great to talk with you. You're up and coming for sure. No, thank it's you. Up and coming for sure. It's, it's really a pleasure to see this young generation like this. It, it gives us hope. Yeah. And I, I love it. Thank yeah. you for coming yeah. this afternoon. No, thanks for this opportunity. This and was, uh, you will come back and visit with us again? As the session goes on? Oh, anytime. Okay, right. wonderful. Anytime, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Marsha. You are indeed the handmaiden. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank I you. I love you both. <laughs>